Joining us right now is Daniel Strauss, Vice President, Head of ETF Research and Strategy from National Bank Financial. Daniel, it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. Good to be here. Daniel, earlier we were talking um, about the differences between the Canadian mm -hmm. ETF market and the U.S. ETF market. Yeah. You'd think it was one big melting pot, but it's not. Right. Uh, how does the uh, Canadian ETF landscape differ? How does growth in the ETF, mm -hmm. in the Canadian ETF space, differ from the yeah. U.S. space? It's an interesting question because the Canadian market was the birth of the first ETF. We had the first fixed income ETF, the first yeah. currency hedge ETF. So really the site of a lot of innovation in the ETF world has been happening here in Canada. But it's been lagging the United States on a relative basis in terms of growth, still growing faster right now, yeah. but uh, US ETF assets are 4 trillion, and in Canada it's something like 180, 185, maybe 190 billion Canadian, so roughly 1 20th the asset, which is on a proportionate basis, maybe half as big as ETF market in Canada should be, and we project will be. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the one hand, you have this kind of disproportionately fewer assets, but on the other hand, you have proportionately way more products. We've got 850 ETFs in Canada, whereas in the U.S. there are about 2,000. And the reason for that is there are many, many new entrants to the marketplace. Almost every mutual pro fund provider, asset manager, insurance company, boutique provider, hedge fund manager, they're all basically thinking of hanging an ETF shingle, launching their products in Canada for the first time. Yeah. So there's 30-some providers in Canada where there's 70 or so in the U.S. Yeah, it's very different. I mean, you, you think that the mutual fund incumbents, mm -hmm. it makes sense that they would, that uh, I think I think initially, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think initially the issue was mm -hmm. that active managers at mutual yeah. fund companies were not going to launch passively, pa passive index right. funds yeah. within their shops because it would, it would conflict with their, right. their whole yeah. ideology. That's true, and in fact, the trend has been surprising yeah. for a couple of reasons. Number one is, some active managers have gone ahead and launched passive products. You know, McKenzie, Franklin Templin, they've got passive index tracking products, very, very cheap, yeah. going right there into the same space and competing with the Black Rocks and Vanguards of the world. So that itself is surprising. But the other element that has, I think, helped Canada's ETF market recent growth is the fact that so many of these providers are putting active strategies up on the exchange. In the U.S., you don't see that as often. There's something of a different culture there and right. a different regulatory environment. In the United States, all ETF providers must disclose their baskets, their portfolios, on a daily basis. And many active managers are reluctant to do that. It's a lot of overhead. It's, it's yeah. a lot of overhead, and they don't right. want to give up their secret sauce, as it were. If they right. did have any kind of secrets to their trading strategies, they don't want to necessarily telegraph that to the entire street. In Canada, we have, um, we've been allowed to have for a long time semi-transparent ETFs in which the right. portfolio really is only disclosed to the mar participating market makers who uh, sign NDAs and pledge not to disclose those baskets to the street. And uh, as a result, the ETF market making function can proceed along uh, very efficiently, even though the ETF itself needs not disclose its portfolio any more frequently than a mutual fund already does, which is, you know, I believe that quarterly or top 10 holdings with a one month lag yeah. and so on. It's a, it, it seems like, I, you know, the Canadian market seems to be more dynamic in that respect mm -hmm. than, than the U.S. market. That's I right, mean, yeah. the, the rules are a little less yeah, there's been less a lot restrictive, of, right? That's true. There's yeah. been a lot of experimentation here. I mean, one reason we have uh, nearly double the products on a proportionate basis is because for every international exposure, you're going to find a uh, currency hedge and a non-hedge version, sometimes even a variably hedged version. So uh, some providers will have three, sometimes four, if they are putting out a U.S. dollar denominated version of a ticker symbol on the exchange. Whereas in the U.S., uh, perhaps the investment marketplace hasn't really thought about currency hedging yeah. uh, as such a bedrock principle within uh, portfolio management. But I think Canadians, because of the Canadian dollar and its relative volatility to global currencies, have been thinking about currency management and currency hedging for much longer. Where do you see, for, I mean, in the Canadian landscape, where do you see the future of the ETF business? Like, what's your, what's your outlook for active versus passive strategies? And, 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 yeah. and uh, if you have, a, if you have a, a moment, we can maybe also drill down a little bit into the, what's defined as active here yeah. and what's, you know. Sure. But because a lot of the active, the 24% of the market in Canada mm -hmm. that's active, yeah. ETFs, um, are defined as active, but yeah. they're not like, like, right. like an actual, like yeah. an active yeah. invested, actively invested fund. Sure. But yeah. so, um, judging by the reaction from the market, what, like, 
where do you see most growth coming from? Is it going to come yeah. from active equity, active, active fixed income? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're or passive. Right. The, uh, yeah, that's right. The, uh, the lines are definitely blurring between uh, traditional active and even traditional passive because on the one side, you might consider smart beta or strategic ETFs as fully passive, but they're really not. They have embedded algorithmic rules-based, essentially active management strategies right. into their indices. And even on the active side, we, we count 24% of the AUM uh, in, in Canada and the ETF world as being active. But we're including quite a few ETFs that also themselves have pretty algorithmic kind of quant-based rules. Right. They just don't track a uh, publicized index. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of funds that do that. There's a, a tremendous number of covered call ETFs in Canada, which may have a, a quasi-passive equal weight basket of stocks right. as the underlying, but a very active call option overlay. So we consider that fully active because the active <coughs> uh, option manager is going to very much determine how well that particular strategy does. There's right. a few other um, quantitative ETFs out there that don't track an index. You know, Bank of Montreal, second largest provider in Canada now of ETFs, they've got a few dividend and low volatility strategies, right. which uh, they've explained to us follow very, very strict quant methodologies, but they don't license or pay a third party indexer um, and, you know, they'll say, pass the savings along to the end investor. So we consider those active too, because uh, fundamentally they do have some human discretion in them and um, there is no index. So, uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, and at the same time, really pure stock picking active is coming to the market now as well. We're seeing a lot of growth of that for that in the fixed income marketplace. Amazingly, there's a lot of demand for that in the fixed income marketplace as well, because I think that investors look at the passive space, they look at the trickiness of the bond market, they see the very low yield environment, they see uh, the prospect of potential rate hikes, although those may be further down the line, and, and they are willing to pay an active mm -hmm. manager who can navigate these very turbulent waters. Sure, like for example in high yield, or I mean, Absolutely. like if, you, if, you, if you're in a passive uh, high yield fund, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're basically at the mercy of the market. Right. Whereas, yeah. whereas the perception, at least, mm -hmm. uh, some some people will disagree with that. Yeah. Will argue against that 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 idea. But but if sure. you introduce active management, securities selection to a high yield a high yield ETF, for example, mm -hmm. then then at least the perception, if not the reality, is that there's an element of risk management in there That's to protect right. yeah. to protect the portfolio from from great downside. Right. Well, I mean, we're very data driven. We do our yeah. research at the National Bank, and uh, I think the same argument could be applied potentially even to equities. Um, but uh, the data show that the majority of active managers over the long term uh, underperform. When in reality, the theor theory behind that is that the market is the combined action of all active managers buying and selling securities amongst themselves. And the reason that active managers appear to underperform over the very long term is because of the fees they charge. Right. And it could well be true that. Um, especially in the Canadian mutual fund landscape, for a very long time, managers have been getting away with charging fees, which really add a headwind to investor outcomes, especially if when you're compounding for a very long time. Um, so uh, we feel that the ETFs, uh, the, the greatest good they've delivered to investors is moving the needle on this discussion, uh, providing uh, pathways for even active managers to offer their solutions at mo lower cost to the market because an ETF really is, at the end of the day, it's a kind of an algorithmically traded basket with, um, you know, non-material but, right. uh, but relatively small fixed costs and all the other elements of maintaining the portfolio basket are kind of either externalized or run automatically. So an ETF, even an active ETF, can be run more cheaply than an active mutual fund. You don't need a, a large uh, book of business, let's say, for the, um, for the entire investor base. Yeah. You just need to keep track of your market makers. So there are scaling costs that can be passed along to investors, and that gives even active managers less of a hurdle to overcome when they're trying to beat benchmarks. I think, I, you know, I'm just looking back on, on, on how things have unfolded in passive versus active argument, which is mm -hmm. really, uh, I'm sure you might agree with it, but it's yeah. really a big waste of time. Sure, yeah. um, I look at active and I think, you know, we're like, if you look at active, the biggest argument against active management is that they underperform their mm -hmm. benchmarks. Sure. Okay, but if, they're fun, if, a, if an active fund doesn't look like a benchmark, then that's, you know, it's going to behave differently anyway. That's right. Yeah. Secondly, the, the risk management question comes into, into yeah. play. So, it, you know, if, if an active manager has 90% of the upside capture mm -hmm. and 
70 percent or 80 percent of the downside capture. Um, in the long run, who's better off, the 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 indexer who underperforms, the, the indexer who performs exactly, you know, beta as the market, yeah. or the investor in an active fund, ETF or fund, um, that underperforms the market mm -hmm. uh, in the same given period, sure. but also outperforms the market versus the downside yeah. capture. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, of course, if, if a fund uh, yeah. <laughs> exceeds downside capture, then that's not good, but, yeah. but um, there, seems to be, there seems to be a lot of debate about cost, mm -hmm. um, about performance, yeah. uh, but, but very little time is spent talking about upside capture versus downside capture yeah. on active versus yeah. passive strategies. And you guys, are, yeah. not, sorry, I'm going to go to another. Yeah, sure. you, you guys are in a unique position at, in, at National Bank yeah. because of your open architecture. You're the biggest manager of managers. Mm -hmm. So that puts you in a very unique position sure. as an analyst and a strategist. You, mm -hmm. you have the lay of the land. You basically yeah. have a full, full view yeah. of the entire market as yeah. opposed to being uh, only in-house. You, yeah. really, you really have an open yeah. uh, look at the market. Well, and so well, one of the things I like to say, the National Bank is uh, Canada's sixth largest bank right. out of six. Yep. So uh, National has had to kind of invest uh, heavily in areas of the market that are allowed to be nimble and, and uh, can, can scale well. Uh, ETFs have been a very um, uh, you know, positive growth area for National. It's National Bank Investments, uh, you know, a separate subsidiary from where I work, which is Financial Markets, that right. has uh, started to launch its own ETFs as well. They were pretty late to the game. But, uh, but it's true, National Bank, our, our capital markets desk, is a, uh, uh, is a service provider to all the ETF providers out there, and they want to see the ecosystem grow. Uh, as an analyst, my job is to you know, objectively survey the landscape and offer yeah. uh, uh, just education to, to our clients. And uh, going back to what you're saying about uh, upside and passive uh, and downside capture ratio, it's something that we'd look at uh, quite uh, seriously, not only for active ETFs, but for smart beta as well. Yeah. You know, if something is a quant strategy and uh, claims that it has, let's say, a risk mitigation uh, factor, uh, low volatility, low beta, some kind of optimization, very often the data will show uh, some level of right. effectiveness uh, to that strategy, uh, if, uh, especially if the costs are managed. But, uh, but you're right, I think that the, in some sense, even though we love to debate it, the active-passive debate is a, a bit of a distraction because um, fundamentally when an investor pays a dollar to buy one dollar of a net asset value of, of any investment, that's an active decision. Right. You know? Um, the, the, it's all active. You, can't, you, you, can't, <laughs> you, can, you can only move the active-passive yeah. um, decision P under a different shell until finally you're implicated the end investor who's right. or the investor's advisor who's making a decision to go into this passive ETF or an active one. Yeah, our, our challenge with active ETFs and active mutual funds really is, um, so you want to outsource the stock picking and security picking to an active manager right. because you don't have the expertise to go through all the balance sheets and study the sector and so on. But now, it's, you're implicated in the decision of which active manager do I use? And now I need to do a due diligence and figure which active right. manager is the right one to pick. And if you feel like picking stocks or securities or bonds is hard, picking managers is hard too. Absolutely. You know, because sometimes there's turnover, sometimes they change their methodologies, uh, so have all sorts of different kinds of philosophies and practices. So uh, uh, I think that investors can hardly be faulted for um, rushing towards these, these passive slew of products that have come to the market. It really is an incredible migration um, of, of assets from active to passive that's happening in the United States. A, a little bit in Canada as well, and uh, yeah. I think fundamentally um, it, it sends a strong signal to the market that investors, especially in this post-crisis world, are very cost conscious, and uh, to the extent that all sorts of solutions uh, are on the market, if they're, if they're cost effective for what they deliver, then, uh, then I think investors will be the net beneficiaries. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. Thank it's you been for a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure to be here.